in the audience. Uh, it shows how valuable my predictions are, but it also shows how valuable this panel is. So we are um, delighted uh, to see all of you and to see an extended audience uh, through all of the social media that will take uh, the events today and uh, show them across the globe. Uh, two of our scheduled panelists, uh, Matthew Bishop of The Economist and Sharon D'Agostino, D'Agostino of Johnson & Johnson, uh, are not here. Obviously, they're not here. Uh, because their trains were canceled. Uh, but Roger Mark D'Souza, who directs uh, our important uh, Wilson uh, program, uh, will join the conversation later in the program. There he is. Yes, he is here. Um, uh, to substitute for them. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, Roger Mark, but also uh, we're sad that they can't be here. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to welcome back to the Wilson Center USAID Administrator Raj Shaw, who's a good friend of ours. AID has facilities in this tiny little uh, Reagan Center building. Uh, and uh, Raj hasn't spoken here in two months. Uh, no, 2012, not 2013. Whoa. In 14 months, he then spoke on, on what then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton called the ec economic statecraft, something that I think everyone agrees is a crucial part of the toolbox we use uh, to project a U.S. narrative in the world. Um, uh, as Raj put it, quote, harnessing American ingenuity to advance global development and in the process strengthen our own nation's economy is what we should be doing. The numbers tell the story. Since 2001, AID has formed more than 1,600 public-private partnerships with over 3,500 partner organizations with an estimated value of more than $20 billion with a B in public and private funds. But the work of USAID and public-private partnerships doesn't just provide a bounce to our economy uh, and to uh, our jobs picture. It also enhances our security. At a time when too many see our foreign policy in kinetic terms, like drones and special ops and Guantanamo Bay prison, soft power diplomacy, or I would call it smart power diplomacy, delivers life-saving help to desperate people and improves their image of America. It's an invaluable foreign policy tool. Think Thailand in 2004 in the devastating tsunami. All of you were old enough to remember that. In relief efforts, Americans and Thais worked side by side to deliver food and supplies. Americans, Americans lined up to donate blood. A U.S. humanitarian assistance helped build trust with Thailand's government and with the Thai people. Building this relationship played an important part in the CT efforts, counterterrorism efforts, with Thai authorities, uh, which were uh, led to a very successful outcome um, just uh, a little bit later. Segue to the Philippines, or Japan, or Pakistan, or even Iran after its devastating uh, earthquake, and to today. Let's talk about Syria. Syria is a moral catastrophe. Secretary Kerry's announcement of an additional $380 million in humanitarian assistance in January brings our total commitment to $1.7 billion. That's good news. But we can and should do more. Increased aid can thwart recruitment from terror groups like the Nusra Front and ISIS uh, and can change the situation on the ground. The Wilson Center is proud to be the leading forum on maternal health and food security innovation through our Maternal Health Initiative and Environmental Change and Security Program, which Roger Mark heads. And a new ES ECSP report, Harvesting Peace, Food Security, Conflict, and Cooperation, examines the relationships between food insecurity and conflict, recommending that humanitarian and development partners work more closely together. So Raj, our friend Raj is here to chart out where we are going in 2014. After he speaks, he will take part in an all-star panel featuring uh, Earl Blumenauer, my, my very good friend who was elected to Congress in 1996 and whom I served with for many, many years. Uh, he is one, Earl is one of the brains behind USAID's first global water strategy, which was launched in May 2013. Our moderator is uh, Jason Bobien, wonderful name, we've just been discussing this, uh, NPR's global health and development correspondent. And I'd also like to recognize many Wilson supporters in the audience, but uh, particularly the ambassador from the Philippines, who is, where is he? There he is, sitting in the, in the second row. Um, Jose uh, uh, 
uh, Kuisia. Um, I mentioned Earl, uh, and I think that's it. Um, uh, Dr. Shaw will now speak, and right after his remarks, the panel begins. Uh, so welcome all of you, and again, happy Valentine's Day. Thank you, Jane, and uh, thank you for your leadership here at the Wilson Center and uh, certainly in Congress. The topic of today's conversation, which Jane was describing as we walked in, was really about defining America's role in the world, and uh, you've been doing that for quite some time very effectively. Uh, Earl Blumenauer, it's great to be here with you. Thank you for, for being here. And I also want to thank Jason and, and Roger Mark. Uh, the ambassador, so many friends and colleagues. I, I too am glad folks are here. I, I, if you're walking through our offices, which are right next door and in the building, I think most of our folks are teleworking <laughs> or uh, got stuck in the snow. So this is great to see people uh, out today. You know, it, it is true that this discussion should really be about what America stands for in the world and how we stand for it. And the answer to that question cannot only and just always be uh, what our military is doing. It's got to be more comprehensive in a manner that captures uh, certainly our diplomatic and development efforts in government, but also captures the full range of American institutional partnerships around the world in business, science, innovation, and technology. And it is true that uh, when you look across sectors and around the world, whether it's in Colombia where we're helping to bring Starbucks and small farmers together so that people can be reintegrated after a, a difficult uh, war and, and guerrilla situation, or whether it's in Syria where uh, of the four and a half million people inside of Syria that get relief, about three and a half million get relief because of American support, uh, or whether it's in Afghanistan, where the eight million kids and three and a half million girls who are now in school are uh, not talked about much, but are very much a part of whether that country succeeds uh, regardless of uh, military presence over the long term. These efforts make a huge difference in shaping and defining the world in front of us. So I look forward to a discussion today about how to best execute that mission in a modern way. And in that context, I'd like to sort of pose a question to you, which is how can we put the power of business, science, and innovation into the hands of those who serve this mission, whether it's serving on a humanitarian basis or working on the longer-term partnerships designed to end extreme poverty and build resilient democratic societies around the world? Now, it might be thought of as an unusual question, especially from someone in government leading an agency tasked with doing these things. Uh, but I think we have now learned and seen that the world is different than it used to be a few decades ago. A few decades ago, energy, investment, and resources that went into these parts of the world were, in fact, largely defined by public resource flows. Development aid, World Bank loans, accounted for 60, 70, 80 percent of flows of capital into the countries we're talking about. Today, we are a small fraction of that. Uh, despite having maintained our commitments and our level of commitments and even increased those commitments, uh, we are thankfully far outstripped by private investment and business relationships <laughs> in nearly every country in which we work. And so when we think about the future of engaging the world through developmental activity, we're not thinking anymore about just paying for infrastructure and services as important as those activities are. Instead, we're now thinking about, as uh, Earl Blumenau and others have suggested in other settings, how do we build the kinds of partnerships that really, in a results-oriented way, can reshape the, vulnerable, the vulnerability in the world in which we live. We cannot pay our way out of extreme poverty, but if we engage businesses and companies, if we motivate scientists and technologists, if we use American innovation, whatever pocket of American society it comes from, including the government, and apply it to, to live out the founding premise upon which JFK created USAID, which was we tackle poverty abroad, we make our world safer and more secure, 
we believe we can end extreme poverty within the next two decades. And that means ending extreme poverty for the 1.25, for the 1.1 billion people who live on a dollar and a quarter a day. It means ending widespread hunger for the 860 million people that will go to bed hungry tonight. And it means virtually eliminating the reality of high levels of preventable child death for the 6.6 .6 million kids that will go, that will die this year before ever reaching their fifth birthday. Now it's easy to step back and say, you know, that sounds great, but those tasks are simply not achievable. But in each case, we've made huge progress. Child survival, as The Economist has previously noted, is probably the single greatest developmental achievement of the last 20 years in terms of what all of this work has actually done. 20, in 1990, 44% of the global economy of the world's population lived on the rough equivalent of a dollar or a dollar and a quarter a day. Today it's 22%, and in 20 years, if we do the right things, it could be 3%. But we're only going to get there if we do things a little bit differently. And so I'd like to describe to you today some of the efforts we've put in place over the last few years to reshape how we do our work <coughs> and to motivate a greater degree of partnership to achieve those goals. First, we restructured how we work in order to partner more fundamentally with local institutions of all kinds all around the world. And in the last few years, we've, we've supported more than 1,200 local institutions in 73 countries a 50% increase over 2010. And what that means is we now have direct partnerships with local banks that are investing in small-scale agricultural businesses. It means we're funding and partnering with local civil society organizations that help uh, women express their uh, leadership capacity in rural villages in Africa. And what it means is we fund and work with uh, women's groups in New Delhi so that when tragic things happen, they're able to have a voice and be more active and engaged and partner with peer organizations here in America to carry out their task and their vision. We've also made a big pivot, as Jane mentioned, to focus on partnerships with private organizations and companies in particular. Today we have global relationship managers for our top 35 private sector partners. And what that means is we're working with Walmart, in a dozen countries around the world to help reach hundreds of thousands of small-scale farmers, providing technical assistance and support, but also connecting them to a real market, uh, in this case Walmart, uh, that is going to be there for the long haul and sustain their gains. It means when we tackle a famine in Somalia, we're able to reach out to our partners at Cargill, and if they have, as they did, the capacity to redirect a $7 million shipment of rice and and put it quickly into the Somali economy so that it can get to famine-affected areas, we can be more responsive and save more lives. And it means that we partner with our colleagues at Google to do everything from mapping uh, communities around Lahore so that we can do a better job of finding and vaccinating young kids, to helping uh, to invest in entrepreneurs creating new businesses to tackle extreme poverty and uh, make a living for themselves. Uh, by using private means. We've now sent a, field, a cadre of field investment officers to our missions around the world. And these are folks who, uh, I think it's the only time in the Foreign Service we've had that uh, cone of officer. Uh, what it allows us to do is to identify private investment opportunities and connect those investment opportunities to partners and investors here in the United States and around the world. So we're bolstering our traditional aid programs by, in the last year alone, using our capacity to provide loan guarantees to 26 new partners mobilizing $500 million in 19 countries. And for every dollar we mobilize through our Development Credit Authority, uh, for every $28 of private investment we mobilize, we end up spending about $1 when a loan fails and we have to cover part of the loss. So it's an extraordinary deal, and in these uh, budget environments these days, we're always looking for good deals to advance our mission. We call this approach a new model of development, a model that relies on asking governments to reform the policies and programs that they've put in place to fight corruption and to prioritize the poor. 
But it's a model that also requires us to do things differently, to be more nimble and more flexible, to reach out to private sector partners at home and abroad, and to bring more engagement to tackle the kinds of problems we want to solve. When I started at USAID, about 8% of our resources were programmed through this new way of working. Today, we think it's about 40%. And we hope to increase that over time. And what that effectively means is that when there are disasters, instead of simply providing aid and assistance, we're also laying the groundwork for recovery and rehabilitation. I'm thrilled that our ambassador from the Philippines is here because that's a great example. My two, the two most important things that happened in the US response to the Philippines were far from the cameras. The first, as the ambassador knows, uh, was a sharing of uh, climate data and predictive data that allowed the Philippines government to evacuate 700,000 people before the typhoon hit. And you know, we all saw those early estimates of death toll being far higher than what people ultimately found was the consequence. And it's in large part because in partnership we were able to get that done. The second part, also not seen on TV, uh, was how we stood up energy systems and food systems and got health clinics back in operation. And yes, it was our wonderful military and developmental humanitarian partners doing great work. But it was also pulling together a consortia of companies, mostly local, that got those systems back up and running and did so quickly. And I think that's telling, because today, it is those kinds of partnerships that give us the confidence to think that we can achieve extraordinary things. I mentioned the possibility of ending preventable child death around the world. How are you going to do that? Everyone should ask that question. Well, one answer is we partnered just a month ago with GE in East Africa to bring power and energy to hundreds of health clinics throughout East Africa. That project is going to be outstanding and is supported by one of the loan guarantees I was talking about earlier. We do have an estimated uh, loss related to that that we have to account for on, in terms of public funds. But in this case, GE said, you know what? This is such a good deal for us. We will pay for any loss you suffer using your credit guarantees. So at virtually no cost to the American taxpayer, through creative partnership, we're essentially going to bring power, light, and cold chain capacity to hundreds of health clinics throughout East Africa, which will help save lives and improve the delivery of health care. Opportunities to do this are endless, from Colombia to Syria to Afghanistan to Africa. So I'm eager to join the panel here because I believe that America has much greater capacity to do this work in this manner than we're tapping into today. And I look forward to your ideas as to how we kind of get there going forward. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was very interesting. And I'm hoping that we can just have an open dialogue here. Feel free to jump in on each other uh, as we we go along, and we'll get to questions from the audience um, right towards the end as, as well. Um, first, I, I'd like to ask you, Congressman, I think this question of what is the role of the private sector in the United States' image abroad and its development abroad, what is the proper role? Because on the one hand, it, it can do some amazing things, but I think there's also probably some concern that the interests of the private sector, the U.S. private sector, may not always be aligned with the best interests of the people in some of these developing countries. And there might be some cynicism from people in those places. And at the same time, you're dealing with you know, budgets in, in Congress, which are shrinking. What do you see as the proper role and constraints of, of, of the private sector? Well, I find uh, what Administrator Shaw's uh, described being very encouraging. I think that the legitimate long-term interests of American business is very much like this. And it's not some sort of misguided altruism. I mean, the history of GE, Coke, Walmart is not one of sort of benevolent, uh, uh, you know, not worrying about the bottom line. I mean, it's, these folks are serious about making a profit. Absolutely. But they've been able to identify, I think, 
areas where it just makes sense. If uh, Coke has uh, a keen interest in sustainable supply of water around the globe, the extent to which they're able to partner with USAID, uh, other NGOs, um, it helps meet this objective which deals with their ability to actually function in these companies. And it also helps them uh, deal with market. Because if they are identified as part of the solution as, a par as opposed to part of the problem, um, people who are making their own economic choices will gravitate towards them. Uh, I think uh, we have not always uh, been regarded, uh, I mean, I think of, you know, Central America, United Fruit, I mean, there are a whole host of things where we have uh, not measured up to our standards and short-term profit has sometimes uh, moved in directions that have not uh, shown necessarily a favorable light nor in the best interests of the company in the long term. But this, I think we've turned a corner. I think people are realizing that it's in their best interests. Um, and we as a country are going to be well served if we can figure out how to, how to identify, promote. Um, the last thing I would say is that some of the technologies that are being utilized uh, internationally, uh, being on the ground uh, uh, immediately after the uh, terrible uh, uh, earthquake in uh, Haiti and watching what a, a little Oregon NGO had been able to do partnering with mobile banking. Whoa, this is, this is now spread dramatically, may have applications here in our country. So simple, common sense, technological advancement, whether it's dr uh, irrigation, bicycles, um, <laughs> uh, or mobile banking, help internationally, can make a difference here at home. And, and Roger Mark D'Souza, in your research and the work that you do, do you see an increasing role for the private sector um, in the fields that you're studying? Thank you very much, Jason. I think it's a, a very good point. When I was listening to, to both the, um, uh, both of you, what struck me was that the conversation around private uh, public sector collaboration and partnerships really has changed. It really has shifted now. And this is something that we at the, at the Woodrow Wilson Center have been looking at and have, have found globally that there have been really three driving trends that have, have helped um, change the dialogue and perspective on this new development approach, um, as, as you call it, this, this new model of development. And, and I think of it uh, somewhat as a pep talk. And that pep talk really is looking at population. How, what's new about population variables? What does it mean? How do demogra demographic trends have an impact? What does it mean in terms of consumption levels and vulnerability? You talk about the Philippines. You talk about East Africa. Um, the second is looking at what, what we call event speed up. When, when this kind of catastrophe happens, we're seeing that the shocks reverberate more quickly and more widely than they have previously. And what's the role of technology in responding? And what is the corporate sector's role and the interest in looking at the bottom line? And what does it mean for overall development? And the last, last P in this pep talk for me is around partnership and recognizing that there's a changing development ecosystem that really we're looking more at the corporate sector as a, a role, having a very key role in this development ecosystem. So these three trends are very important and significant in, in changing this dialogue about corporate engagement and its role in overall development. Dr. Shah, do you hear, when you're going out to other countries, concern from people in those countries that the interests of GE in being part of this project might not be aligned directly with the people in India, for instance, or whatever. And how do you respond when you're in a, in a country and you're trying to, to pitch a project like this? Well, you know, I, I do hear that. Uh, and unfortunately, I think I hear it more often than a, you know, it's appropriate. There's certainly a history in development of uh, some pretty prominent companies having a, a very poor track record of community impacts. And, and that, I think, has lingered for decades. Uh, but 
you know, if you actually look at what's going on, it, it, it is pretty easy to get to the conclusion that this approach works. So, you know, we work in Ethiopia with DuPont. We, we've asked the Ethiopian government to make some reforms to its seed sector so that they can get Ethiopian scientists and uh, varieties that are tested on the soil there to be effective and then work with a whole host of seed companies to commercialize, in this case, hybrid maize and get it to farmers. And uh, today DuPont is reaching 35,000 additional farmers and we're in dialogue about how do we get to 3 million through partnerships with, with us and uh, local partners there. The, the most important part of that, of course, has nothing to do with the, it's all about what's going on at the farm household level. These are farmers who, you know, are usually barely subsistence producers. Maybe they'll sell a little bit of extra food on the, on the market if they have <coughs> produced it, and often have a two to three month period during the year that everyone refers to as the hungry season, when kids and mothers and fathers go without food or without adequate nutrition. Uh, the bottom line is that for these 35,000 households, they've now beaten that. They're producing significantly more food, they're selling it in commercial markets, they're reinvesting their profits and improving their, their food production, and this is the path to end widespread hunger without giving out food, but rather relying on the industry and enterprise of, of small businessmen and women, which is who these uh, small farmers are. So in my view, this approach works. And it's a reason to do more of it, not an excuse to cut back on our public budgets or to cut back on our uh, other, other necessary and critical complementary commitments. Um, Congressman, do you think, however, that there might be an interest in, in Congress, given budget constraints, to have almost everything get, get outsourced to, to private sectors in terms of aid and development? Um, there are some, perhaps. But um, the fact is that these partnerships um, actually do require a significant investment. The notion of your 35 managers who are, who are working with these relationships. Uh, the more people understand that th these are transformative. Um, sitting in the coffee exchange yeah. for Ethiopia in Abbas, just watching these folks developing the capacity to be able to market uh, their own product, uh, building skills, not just marketing coffee, but other economic infrastructure, and that it is good for American businesses. Um, I don't think we should look at this as a shortcut that is necessarily any easier or re requires less investment. I mean, it's embarrassing how little we invest now, and we just had a, a a budget that gave me heartburn with an 8% reduction. But part of that budget, which was interesting, and, and uh, the reference was made to our work with International Water, we've developed, I think, an understanding in Congress that by investing strategically in water, uh, focusing our attention better, getting more out of it, and building partnerships with the community of faith, environmental groups, other NGOs, that it is money extraordinarily well spent. So that budget line increased over a third in this tough climate. And I think the partnerships that are being described here with the private sector, with business, um, if we manage them right, I think Congress will go along with more. I, I couldn't resist today. I thought it might come up. Um, you know, anytime <laughs> Jane throws a part, I'm not surprised everybody's here. I'm, I'm surprised <laughs> there's an empty seat. Um, but <laughs> I, I brought the latest copy of the National Journal, which talks about the most polarized Congress ever. And then I pulled the special issue from two years ago that talked about the most polarized <laughs> Congress ever. Which you had saved. I did. I mean, there's a lesson here. The subtext, by the way, is the most polarized Congress ever until, until next, next year. year. <laughs> but what we are talking about here has the potential of bringing people together. It stretches resources. You know, the Jane fought for years in, in terms of the national security space. I mean, we 
spill more in a, <laughs> in a weekend uh, than, uh, than you spend in a month. Um, this is the best money that we invest and that it is something that, that brings people together. If we do the dive you're talking about, and it's Walmart, and it's GE, and it's Coke, um, it's Nike, we've got a little shoe store in my uh, neighborhood uh, that is doing a lot of work in terms of trying to protect labor and environmental standards. And I don't mean to s single out uh, four or five companies. There are lots of them that are there. Congress needs to get on board, understand it, and when they do, I think the evidence is that it makes a difference and, and we can fund this. You, you do a lot of work with maternal health and in environmental security. Are, are there some places where the private sector doesn't really fit properly, was the question I was going to ask you. Mm. Um, it, I'm wondering whether, you know, certainly in terms of infrastructure, building electric plants, things like that, where the, the private sector is doing that on its own, but something like maternal health, which is normally, a, a, you know, a government function in so. clinics, are there places where the private sector, you know, isn't really the appropriate way to go? I think that's a very good question, Jason, and I actually want to go back to a point that, that you made about this being an opportunity to bring us together and bring these communities together. Um, you know, Jane Harmon very often describes us as, at the Wilson Center as an intellectual candy shop where you don't get fat on spin. And what's important about that is that we bring the analysis to the table. In fact, we have been uh, just recognized as one of the top global think tanks in the world and the number one U.S. think tank to watch. And this is very important for corporations and for Congress. They need the analysis that we bring to the table to answer exactly the question that you're asking, Jason. And one of the most innovative and exciting things about this analysis that we bring to the table is, is we bring the models and analysis that the corporate sector ordinarily could not find on its own. So yes, there are areas where typically the corporate sector and a corporate private partnership would miss, but that's where you have a think tank or the non-profit um, sector coming in to bridge that role. And this is what is exciting about the opportunity of these partnerships right now. Jason, could I just make one sure, absolutely. small comment? Um, because I think ultimately what's going to make the difference, whether it's child health, or it's if you're one of those 99% uh, of the scientists who think we've got a climate problem, or um, <laughs> what's going to save the world is where we align mm -hmm. these interests so that the billions of decisions that are made every day have the right environmental, economic, humanitarian uh, interests that, that move there so that people do things that will make a difference. And, and I think what is being described here is a way to align those individual decisions, whether they are uh, government programs or they're private sector decisions about where we shop, where we live, how we move. Uh, that's what's going to be transformational. And they are doing this on a scale that I think is truly unprecedented and is extraordinarily exciting. Well, Dr. Shaw, I'd like to ask you, I mean, do you think there are some areas where the private sector shouldn't be involved in this part of the development package that, that we are putting out as, as the U.S. government? No. You know, I, <laughs> I just don't. I mean, you look at maternal and child health as a good example. Of course, you need a lot of public investment to make, make it work and deliver results. Uh, but, you know, our partnership with J&J &J in Uganda and Zambia has brought down maternal death rates by more than 50 percent in about 18 months with strong validated measurement uh, because, you know, of technology, of measurement capability, of logistics partnerships that make that work. The, the massive uh, global HIV AIDS treatment program is underpinned by a logistics system that is in part run with UPS and a number of other partners that know logistics. So there's, there's really no element of any of this that I think you could just say with confidence there's no role for the private sector. Uh, but that's not to discount the fact that, as, as Earl points out, this is a reason to do more in terms of public investment and engagement, not less. You know, you were talking about bringing people together. I've seen myself how these partnerships have brought together 
uh, conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats and everybody else in the mix. Uh, because when you show that you can achieve these kinds of results in such a highly leveraged and clearly measured manner, it's very compelling. It's very compelling. I think people of all walks of life got into this business of public service to deliver results in some form. And this is a very compelling vision that people can get their arms around. The last thing I'd just say is, is you know, if you ask most Americans how much do we spend on foreign aid and assistance, <laughs> the answer is 20 percent. Even yeah. today or yesterday, I was reading by a, you know, a, a well-educated consumer and author in, in the Post a reference <laughs> to $100 billion of aid, development aid we've invested in Afghanistan. That couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, the reality is we spend 1 percent, not 20 percent, of our federal budget on developmental assistance, less than 1 percent. And in Afghanistan, we spend about two weeks of the total cost of our civilian mil mil military enterprise, uh, two weeks of one year's cost on developmental investments that have led to 1,800 miles of new road and 8 million kids in school and the fastest reductions in maternal and child health anywhere in the world and a 30 percent. Uh, a 300 percent improvement in local revenue collection so they can stand on their own two feet after our aid and assistance goes away. So I, I just think it's important to keep it all in perspective and to see this not in any respect as a rationale to do less, but it gives us an opportunity to do more. But what is being done to make sure that these American companies, all of these are very large companies, aren't coming in and big footing a local company that's based in Africa, that, that it's based in, in Southeast Asia? I mean, what's being done to make sure that we're not just allowing this American power, commercial power, to sort of be monopolized and move across the globe? Well, let me say two things about that, and then I'm eager to hear from others. First, the bulk of our public-private partnerships are with local companies. And uh, I think Jane in her opening said 1,600 public-private partnerships. I'll bet more than 11 or 1,200 of those are with local companies. And they are thrilled to work with us because they believe we can surface issues, help fight corruption, help uh, motivate certain kinds of reforms that improve the business environment for everybody. Uh, and second, I, I would just point out that you know, in our current world, the places we're talking about are the fastest growing economies anywhere on the planet. So companies from all over the world are seeking a foothold in the six of the ten fastest growing economies in the world, which are in sub-Saharan Africa. And if we can offer a platform to, for American companies to engage transparently and in the right way, I'm proud of the ability to offer that platform, not shy about engaging in those engagements. And we should, and we should do more in a direct fashion. Um, we. And one of the things I, I like with some of our NGO partners, their assistance is uh, putting cash on, uh, in the hands of people who, for example, have suffered from an earthquake or from a tsunami. Um, uh, the, I would hope that we, that we give you more cash and less surplus food, for instance. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, is, it is an embarrassment to me that too often, it takes months for the food to arrive, and when it, and when it arrives, uh, it has the perverse effect of discouraging mm -hmm. local production, local markets. Yeah. Uh, the administration requested a tiny uh, amount of money to be able to balance that out and demonstrate the power of direct investment. Um, and I'm hopeful that we're able to do more of that. Well, on that, in, uh, for example, we, we were, the president's budget last year called for a shift in about 45 percent of our food aid program so we could reach four million additional children every year without spending an additional penny. Uh, and it seemed like an uphill battle, and it will continue to be. But in the farm bill that was signed, we got the flexibility to reach about 800,000 additional children. And, you know, that's incremental, but it's real progress. And for those 800,000 kids, it's going to make You're a You're such a difference. diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> and Jason, I wonder yeah, if I could go, just give another example. And then we're going to open it up to mm -hmm. some questions. So be thinking about questions. Go, <laughs> go ahead. I think that, it, that once again sort of illustrates this, this new development um, ecosystem. And there's a new, new initiative called Family Planning 2020, which is a global initiative to really meet the needs for 120 million women globally 
equally to access reproductive health services. This is a partnership with the British government, DFID, with corporations, with local governments, with USAID, to really work collaboratively to meet an urgent and key development priority right now. So just going back to the framing of your question, yes. it's not only about U.S. corporate interests, but global interests. And there's, there's a shift in that partnership model also that's more globally, more inclusive, and bringing in both governments and local corporations. Now, I know this is being taped and filmed, so uh, were there some mics out there, yes? Yes, yes great. Um, do we have some questions from the audience that you would like to ask? We've got someone in the back, back there. And just wait for the microphone. Great, thank you. Um, Mike McDonald, Health Initiatives Foundation, Inc. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I've done a fair amount of work with public-private partnerships and at a large scale. <laughs> but um, as I reflect on Haiti over the last 20 years, um, I get more and more concerned that the kind of public partnerships that have been described so far really would not set up a, a positive ecosystem in Haiti. That where Haiti's failing is at the very base level of the communities. And I'm just wondering, with big data and social networks, can't we approach getting some resources directly into these communities to enable them to emerge with their own ideas of what of how they want to live, rather than, for example, in Africa, where large corporations are driving people off of their lands into the cities, into uh, places that have no infrastructure. Dr. Shaw, do you want to try that one? Sure. L let me just set uh, set the context a little bit because you know Haiti is uh, a very, very important partner country for us uh, and for many of us in this room. You know, it's important to I think recognize that. There's been tremendous <coughs> progress in Haiti since the earthquake in particular. <coughs> Today, if, if you look at the three years prior to the earthquake and, and uh, the last three, compared to the last three years, private investment is up 300 percent if you compare those two time frames. Uh, the economy is growing at 4.3 percent. Uh, the one and a half million additional kids in school. And of the 1.7 million people who were displaced uh, during the earthquake, all but about 150,000 of them are back in some kind of improved housing unit, and most of those housing units are built back to a higher earthquake standard than before. So that's, I just think, important context. In terms of uh, whether the model works in Haiti, I mean, Earl was talking about this and might speak a little bit more about it, but one of our, one of our partnerships was with uh, mobile phone companies and providers and, and the Gates Foundation to help use that as a platform to get uh, mobile money to rural women throughout Haiti and that made a huge difference and reached lots of families that otherwise wouldn't have been connected to a, a, a modern uh, cash economy in an effective and transparent <coughs> manner. Uh, similarly, I, I do think that the coupling of business investment, the new hotels going up and the Caracol Park uh, where there are jobs being created in the textile industry, coupling that with effective public investment that is bringing down the rate of child death and malnutrition and ha making sure kids that get to school get school meals and can take home school uh, food packages. Uh, those, those things all have to work in concert to see progress. But I, I think the model works there as well. Uh, but the model we're talking about is not just giving companies kind of broad access to uh, land and title in a way that's non-transparent. The, the model we're talking about is engaging in specific partnerships where you measure results, track outcomes, report on them, and hopefully create both private enterprise and public developmental gains. Yeah. Yeah. And make no mistake, I mean, we I don't mean to suggest that we have all of a sudden a lot of uh, benign relationships now with all business. And we have, we're, we're watching uh, large uh, investments being made in developing countries, buying up farmland for large commercial applications so they can export their water. Um, uh, there are oftentimes uh, international multilateral pressures to uh, invest in infrastructure projects on a scale that uh, pose risks for the environment and don't have much uh, trickle-down benefit. Um, I'm. I am concerned that 
in, in most of these situations, we need to develop an, an infrastructure that includes the political infrastructure. I mean, the, the dysfunctionality in Haiti, for a whole host of reasons, is, is mind-numbing um, and uh, frustrating. And, and the progress that has been referenced has been really hard fought. I mean, it shouldn't, shouldn't be this hard, but it is. Um, and we have places where there are, uh, there, there isn't that, um, that uh, political infrastructure where there are people who will take shortcuts. I mean, we've been fighting against illegal logging, for instance, which um, you take poor people, um, you come in, you circumvent the law, you, but you put cash on the, uh, on the table for them and others profit down the line, uh, further destabilizing civil society and eroding the long-term environment, the ecosystem that they face. Uh, so these are, these are hard to unwind, uh, but it is, uh, it is, I think, our responsibility to put in place structures, infrastructure to help people enforce their own local laws or to create them in the first place, and then countries like the United States to respect them so we don't turn a blind eye when people are importing illegally uh, harvested timber or endangered species or whatever. There's, um, there's uh, more that we all can do to try and provide that, um, that, that structure that enables people not to have to choose between feeding their family and killing uh, some rare animal. Uh, it's hard work, yeah. but I think we're moving. And clearly that's what this is all about. Yes, the, you know, aid by itself is not going to be completely transformative and can't control, control everything in the conditions on the ground, but it's about setting a framework that, that is hopefully moving in that direction and is optimizing the U.S. dollars that we're investing into it. Well, we've only got about five or six minutes left, um, maybe in the front here. Uh, wait for the microphone, please. It's coming here. Good afternoon. I want to thank the Wilson Center. This is a very important topic. Hi, Raj. Um, so I work for Management uh, Systems International now, but I had the privilege of working for AID for 25 years. Raj, you mentioned uh, American innovation, and obviously there's a lot of innovation in this country. That's something that we can really share. But my experience overseas illustrated that there's a lot of innovation overseas as well. And I think about the IT sector <coughs> in the West Bank, uh, which was my last posting. Just, you know, mm -hmm. it's there. What's the agency doing in terms of like venture capital and other means to take advantage and, and s leverage and support that? Well, well, thanks for that and for your service. Uh, we've had, you know, we, we've actually done, I think, a really interesting set of things that, that are now maturing, including partnering with private equity and venture funds in Afghanistan, Pakistan, the Middle East, parts of Africa, uh, in Latin America. And, and that has created the capacity to support those kinds of entrepreneurial business starts. I was actually in the West Bank and saw a business plan competition with all of these young programmers having uh, basically pitching to venture capitalists in the region their business ideas. I gotta tell you, they were good ideas. I mean, I'd say half of them were, you know, services we all use as online services tailored to the local context, and half were, were completely novel. And it was just great to see, but there must have been 400, you know, in Ramallah on a Friday night in a big tent. Uh, young entrepreneurs that were pr pitching their sort of business idea and trying to raise funds. And you see that dynamic all over the world. And so I'm, I, I think our aid and assistance should be used to encourage that and engage with it. And it's not just that it, it, those guys and women have so much value for the, we brought over a vice president from Google and someone from Intel. Those brands just speak volumes in these communities all around the world. So. It's not to imply that all innovation comes from here, but people do when they think of successful innovation and successful entrepreneurship. They think usually of American entrepreneurship, and the more we can represent that abroad, I think the better off we are. I think we're gonna have time for just one more question, so maybe a woman in the red there. Uh, actually, I'm going to defer uh, my spot to His Excellency from the Philippines, as I saw he raised his hand for a question as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. First of all, I wanted to thank Dr. Shah for the very interesting presentation and also to publicly acknowledge uh, the great job that USAID and the U.S. military did uh, in the aftermath of Typhoon Haiyan. And uh, I've expressed my appreciation to the government and the American people for the overwhelming generosity uh, in terms of the assistance we got. My question to the congressman, if I may, is um, <laughs> instead of <laughs> reducing uh, foreign aid, considering precisely the kind of great job that USAID, wouldn't US Congress uh, consider providing a greater or ha larger budget for institutions like USAID that not only provide humanitarian assistance, but are also able to develop uh, uh, very, I guess, very attractive business opportunities for, for US firms. Uh, as mentioned, the experience of GE, Starbucks, uh, Walmart, and so on. Um, I am, of course, concerned about the reduction in terms of foreign aid, but I think it also deprives institutions like USAID to do much more uh, for, for US business. Thank you. I want to hear the answer. <laughs> <laughs> you, are of, you are, of course, right. And I, uh, the reference that was made, not just to USAID, but to the United States military. Watching, um, in the aftermath of the, of the tsunami, watching um, uh, our military swing into action on Bandayachi and providing water, and I mean, it's, um, I think that there was more good done in that region, not just for the hundreds of thousands of people whose lives were turned upside down, but candidly, the perception people had about the United States. We are going to spend, over the next decade, approximately $700 billion on a nuclear arsenal that we've not used in 69 years, that has a thousand times more than we need to destroy any country on the globe. The news is about, <laughs> they discovered cheating uh, in the, the missile silos, where we've got 450 missiles on alert with people's fingers on the button. Uh, they discovered that when they were investigating alleged drug abuse on, I mean, it's insane. Uh, so, if we are able uh, to have people do a deep dive, look at the, just that one area, we could reprogram conservatively a half trillion dollars, give you one percent, <laughs> America would be safer, the world would be better off, and we'd save the taxpayers a lot of money. Um, but that, I come back to the power of these concepts where people come together and they see the practical stuff on the ground and these partnerships, because that's what's going to, I think, make a difference for a divided Congress, and more important, for a divided country to have the support that we need to go forward. And unfortunately, we've run out of time. It's been a fascinating discussion and a really important question about how does the U.S. Uh, use this form of its power out there in the world. And thank all of you for coming. Um, and maybe a quick round of applause for our...